everybody to this Simulating Patient Safety webinar. Thank you so much all for, for joining. We're delighted that you could, could, to, could uh, join in with this, this webinar. I hope you find it useful. I know we've got people here who are experts at simulation, some who have probably only just started to use it, and also some patient safety experts. So I'm going to assume that people have some knowledge of simulation, but not total knowledge of it. Um, so I might go through some concepts that perhaps some people have heard before. Uh, but all the, the patient safety models that I'm going to show you, there's a, there's a lot of new material there. So really hope that you enjoy it. Um, my name's Claire Cordeaux. Um, I lead the healthcare team here at Simulate. Um, and I'm very pleased to speak to you about, the, about this today. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping um, uh, rules. Uh, on the audio, can you keep the audio to mute when you, if, um, unless you're going to speak, in which case if you want to speak, just raise your hand. We're going to save questions right till the very end. So mostly we usually ask people to put their questions in the chat um, box on the bottom right hand side. And you can see on your screen there's a uh, just a little icon on, of what that looks like. And if you want to ask a question at the end, then um, please ask that um, there, but also if you'd like to speak, then, then raise your hand as well. Um, and the, <coughs> excuse me, the recording will be available on simulatehealthcare.com after the, um, the workshop. So I think that's all the um, practical things I need to say. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about a bit is just reminding people who aren't so familiar what simulation is. Um, and then I'm going to focus today on why we might use simulation to improve patient safety. And I've got some quite simple models and also some more complex ones. Um, and it is um, interesting how quite simple models can really help uh, make quite an impact. Um, and I'm going to show you a number of applications in healthcare and then there'll be some time for questions at the end. So very quickly, what simulation is, we're using discrete event simulation here, which is a technique which enables us to model a flow of activity through a system. Um, and in patient safety, we're going to be looking uh, mostly at the flow of patients, but sometimes we're going to be looking at the flow of medication, for example, to get to patients within a certain amount of time. Um, and the technique that we're using us, um, enables, enables us to model the passing of time very effectively. Now, of course, in patient safety questions, that's absolutely crucial because very often it's the delay um, of an intervention to a patient um, or an observation that can pick up deterioration, which has an impact on patient outcomes. So if we can measure the passing of time and what we might be able to do if we were able to get that intervention to that patient quicker and what their outcome would be, then um, we, can, we can test out some of our improvement scenarios. Um, and of course, in itself, simulation is a patient safety friendly tool because you can model your system, in your, your healthcare system, uh, whether that's at a, a very micro level or a macro level, um, in a virtual environment, and you can test out your improvement scenarios on patients without any risks to them at all. So um, it's a useful tool or technique for looking at any kind of service improvement um, and making sure that it really is going to have the benefits that you expect. So just to describe it a bit further, um, people who aren't so familiar with um, simulation might be looking at using process mapping, for example, as you can see in the diagram there. What we're doing here is translating a process map to a dynamic process flow, um, and the simulation model on the right-hand side is, this, is showing you how that looks, so that you can ask those deeper questions of what's going on in a system and also test those what-ifs. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm going to start with um, a very simple model on adverse drug events, and I just want to show you this. It's one of the models that I routinely use to show people who aren't so familiar with patient with simulation uh, how it can impact on patient safety. Um, and you can see the model on the screen here. I'll just um, set it running as I speak through it. So we've got the clock at the top there. We've got patients. We've got um, uh, 
medication being ordered for a patient. Now, when they're ordered, they go to the pharmacist. Um, there's a small likelihood that the pharmacist might make a mistake and they might have to go back and be reordered. But um, we wait for the pharmacist to do that review. Um, and then you need the, the medications to come from medication stock. So you've got the stock delivery here. Um, and sometimes the medication is out of stock, so you can't get it, and so you have to wait until the stock becomes available. And then you're going to go to the nurse, and then the nurse will deliver the medication. Now, what we've said in this simulation is that if there, um, there's a 65% chance of an adverse event happening if it takes longer than 60 minutes to deliver medication. Now, this is an example, and um, uh, you might think 65% is rather high, you might want to set it to something else, but just for the purposes of this simulation, we're setting it at 65%. So we can see in our baseline model here, which we've run through the number of orders that have come in, um, and we can see that um, we've had 203, 235 cases where the uh, drug has not reached the patient within 60 minutes, so it's obviously not going well. Um, so we'll, we can try and look at a couple of parameters. Now, when I ran the simulation through, you could see a great big queue of medications waiting for that pharmacist. So let's just have a look at the pharmacist shifts. And we can see that in our demonstration model, we haven't got uh, as many pharmacists as we have nurses. So let's just change that. I can do that very easily. So we've got four pharmacists available. And now we can run that through again <coughs> to test it. So you've still got some queues building up there. I'll run it a bit quicker. And at the end of the simulation, we've managed to reduce our adverse events to 201 from that 235, which is good, but it's, it's um, certainly not good enough. So let's have another look at the medication stock. Um, and we can see that there's very variable deliverables, um, delivery amounts. So again, we can change these. So I'm just going to have the same amount each day. And we'll run that through again. So you haven't quite got, you've still got some weights there. Um, but actually it's going more smoothly than it was. And we've now reduced those adverse events to 80. Well, that's obviously not acceptable. We don't really want any adverse events. And we don't, we don't want patients waiting for... Um, for over now for their medication. But um, I show that really as an example of a very simple simulation which you can use as part of your improvement work to test out the impact of your resources, whether they're staffing, whether they're uh, medication or other kind of equipment, on the delays of care, treatment, in this case um, medication getting to patients, which is going to affect their outcomes. And in a way this is the sort of the people who are familiar with simulation will recognize this immediately. Um, but sometimes we don't always go to the end of our simulation to look at the outcome for the patient of, of a particular change. And just by very simply adding that proportion of outcome, outcomes that you expect to see from the evidence that you have into your simulation, you can very quickly test out not just the cost and um, uh, and the resource um, and the utilization of your staff, but you can also test out uh, those patient outcomes. So that's really just by way of introduction um, into our subject today. Now, one of the things I've been interested in is how simulation is routinely used in other high-risk industries. And uh, many of you will know uh, those kinds of examples, uh, but I'll just go through some of them. Um, in the nuclear power industry, for example, um, we know of nuclear power plants that are pretty much 
run their entire system using simulation to work out when they need to order new parts to make sure that they're there on time. Also very interesting studies of things like operator performance and what happens if you multitask and are you more likely to, to make errors. In the airline industry, um, we have examples of where uh, simulation is used for fleet maintenance and when you should replace parts, obviously absolutely crucial uh, in that industry. Maritime industry uses simulation to look at ship routing, um, it very often to avoid ship collisions and make sure you, you take some of the danger out of, of maritime, um, maritime routes. Um, in the oil industry and, and in fact the oil, gas industry, looking at oil transportation, making sure that you've got the right product going to the right place. Um, obviously there's a massive environmental risk of things going wrong there. Um, so simulating that to make sure that the, there's an impact. Um, and in the prison population, for example, um, looking at the number of cells that you might need as a result of, um, uh, of the number of prisoners that you're expecting. So we see this being routinely used in other high-risk industries, and it isn't really routinely used in, in patient safety. In fact, one of the reasons I'm giving this talk today is because I was asked to speak to the Academic Health Science Networks in the UK about how simulation could be applied um, in patient safety. And um, so I knew that people didn't ask us very much about those sorts of questions. So I went to the research literature and there's very, very little written up about use of simulation in in patient safety and I'm really hoping someone's going to say that there's a large amount and I've just missed it um, but um, there isn't really that much that that you can find and that's surprising to me because very often the problems are in patient safety are systemic um, they're they're repeated we see when you look at patient safety statistics and I used to work in a patient safety team at a, in a regional health authority so um, this is familiar to me, um, you see the same sorts of mistakes being applied time and time again and you know that it must be a systemic issue. So I'm not saying simulation is the only thing that you could apply, but it's certainly something that can really help you work out what's going on in your system in the way that activity routes around your system that you might be able to um, pinpoint as being the reason that things go wrong and design in best practice and make sure that that doesn't happen again because um, with the horrendous statistics that you all know about 10% of um, patient interventions ending in error uh, and being responsible I think for about the, the third highest number of deaths in, um, uh, in inpatient admissions. Um, really we, need, we, we all know we need to do something about this and we really think that simulation can help. So. Why would you use simulation to improve patient safety? Well, you can test your interventions and impact before the implementation. It helps provide a robust evidence base for change. And also your best practice messages can be shared very easily with, the, with your stakeholders. So you can test them, people can understand why you might make those changes, just in the way that you would run a, run a role play, uh, for example so that you allow people to experiment with their improvement ideas before they implement them. So the things that I want to concentrate on um, in, in this talk are four different areas where we, uh, we've looked at where you could apply simulation and patient safety and, and you may well have others and we'll have a LinkedIn discussion going on after this uh, webinar and I'd love you to contribute your ideas and thoughts to that so that we can expand this conversation. So yes, these are the four areas um, I'm going to look at, which one is interruptions, the next is delays, looking at adoption of best practice and then we've got a specific model that we've been developing looking at sepsis that I want to share with you. So the first area, um, looking at medication errors due to interruptions and this picks up that case study from nuclear power sta stations about the multitasking um, and I think we all know that um, if you try and multitask you're much more likely to, to, um, to that you're much, there's much more likely to be an error because it's hard to concentrate to, to do two things at once um, and there are um, there, 
there is research that backs this up. And what, one of the things we can use simulation for is the impact of designing out those interruptions. So um, I've looked through some of the systematic reviews on um, interruptions and errors during medication administration. Um, and you can see here from some from this BMJ um, study that actually you get a, a higher likelihood of um, error if you're multitasking uh, or if there are interruptions to you um, than if there are no interruptions. Um, and it's for this kind of reason, as we know, that a number of hospital providers have um, in, had a new, no interruption zone with visual markers. You often see um, nurses with a, with a coloured tabard doing their medication round as a signal that people should not interrupt them. Um, this comes from the airline industry, the idea of a sterile cockpit. So when you're doing something really crucial, um, actually there are no interruptions. Um, and there are recommendations around good preparation, for example, having all your equipment ready. Um, but we thought it would be interesting to build a simulation to just quantify what this really means. Um, so what we did was we built a, simula a very simple simulation again, looking at interruptions to a medication round. So we, this is going to run from 9 in the morning to 9 at night for one month. Um, and the medication rounds happen at 9 in the morning at 3 p.m. and they're going to last for two hours. And what we're saying is that there are interruptions every 45 minutes and each interruption is going to take 10 minutes. Um, and if somebody is interrupted, then they have a 10% chance of error, which is slightly less than in that, that um, systematic review data I've just showed you. So let's have a look at that simulation now. So here we are, very simple, um, and takes almost no time to build, um, but helps get over this, um, this particular point very well. So here we have the interruptions arriving here, and then the medication round times here. What happens is they <coughs> the medication round takes place twice a day. When you get to this complete task, if there's an interruption, when we're just having a uh, we can allow that to be interrupted, and then you can see that 10% likelihood of an error. So I'll just run that through. And you can see as we run through the time that we have completed ward rounds with no errors versus completed ward, round, ward rounds with errors. At the end of the month, we've had 15 completed ward rounds with errors. So let's just test that um, against what happens when there is this no interruptions rule. I'm just going to cha change this here to make sure that I'm not going to be interrupted. And let's just run that through again. And as it runs through, you can see that as a result, we've got no errors. So again, a very, very simple model to try and bring that message home uh, because the research evidence is great, but sometimes you need to be able to localise that to your individual situation and your particular healthcare team in order to make it real. Um, <clears throat> the same sort of concept could be used for simulation, simulating intentional rounding, and I think everyone will be familiar with the harm-free care um, and you know, best practice, which is that really you should have in intentional rounds, frequent rounds to patients for observations to make sure, particularly in areas where they might uh, be deteriorating for some reason, uh, to make sure that you can pick that up. Um, and intervene um, immediately. So um, again, we could, you could run a similar sort of simulation, but looking at the impact of rounds. And I think when the, looking at some of the research evidence uh, around this, and I picked up something from the Nursing Times on this, is that people feel, yes, it, it, it seems to be the right thing to do, and it does. There are reported improvements in things like pain management, 
falls, pressure ulcers, that kind of thing, if you implement this. But what people are afraid of is, um, well, how, how's that going to deploy my nursing staff? Um, if I've got to have hourly rounds, that's going to tie them up when they could be doing other, other things. Which patients should I use it for? Um, is that going to cost me huge amounts? Am I going to need a lot of additional nurses? And very often it's not being able to answer that kind of question that stops people from adopting best practice. So uh, with a simulation like this that picked up, um, instead of a medication round, an intentional rounding, for example, and looked at uh, resource utilisation, so in this case the use of the nurse here uh, to do that particular job, would help quantify what that actually meant uh, and perhaps drive some decisions that help improve patient outcomes. So moving on to another um, simple but effective simulation, um, we were looking, this was last year actually at IHI, we were looking at the bring, putting some lean concepts, um, developing lean concepts as a simulation to very easily and quickly show um, uh, what would happen if you implement lean. And, and this is looking at batching and single piece flow. So I'm just going to run this through. We've preset this up so you've got the same process taking place with, de with demand arrivals and prescription orders, um, comparing the single piece flow against the batching. Um, we've got batches of six here. Um, and you can see the results co being compared there so we're kind of the same sorts of levels of throughput that varies as we're running it through. Um, uh, sorry, the average units in the system is five. And, uh, but what the important thing is that the average time in the system is uh, 29 minutes as opposed to 134 minutes with the batch process. Now, if we just go back to looking at thinking about that original um, model that I showed you um, and comparing the results there, you can see that you know somebody's got to wait over two hours for their medications. So that's really not going to help um, help their um, their outcomes. So again, a simple simulation that just helps bring take over that that, that particular concept. Um, and my colleague Brittany, who um, very often is talking to you on this in this series of webinars. Um, has a story of a piece of work she did, it was a study of, of five US um, hospitals and one of the things that she found was that patients that were closer to the automated dispensing machine um, were much less likely to have a medication error because what was happening was the nurse was less likely to batch all the medications because the, the patient was there, the machine was there, much more likely just to do one at a time whereas if you're a bit further from the machine you probably batch a few at a, 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 and then there were more likely to be errors. So you can um, absolutely see practically how this is likely to occur in, um, in a system just because of the location of equipment and how, how it all works. So um, using simulation you can start to test out uh, what the impact might be of just changing your, where your, um, your dispensing machine is automated, um, uh, and, and looking at how you manage your system, uh, but it gives you the evidence that this is really worth doing if you want to reduce patient errors. So I've shown you a number of um, quite small models that look at particular areas of um, patient safety. Um, this is a, a, a larger model which is looking uh, across uh, at actually all emergency beds, so it's looking at a, a much bigger question. Um, and uh, as you can see in the screenshot here, uh, what we're looking at is bed capacity, but we're, we're looking at it not just in terms of um, bed utilisation, but also the implication that if you wait for a bed for over four hours, we know the research says that mortality rates and length of stay are, are increasing. And from a patient safety perspective, it's the, length, it's the mortality rates that's, that's the problem here. Um, and what we did was we built a simulation which um, took in the number of admissions by hour and day of the week and you can see how that varies day by day and also looks at the number of midnight stays by hour and day of the week so if you come in um, on a particular day of the week at three o'clock in the morning 
then your likelihood of staying a number of nights is going to be affected by, um, by, by the time at which you arrive. So we use that to model the number of midnight stays by hour. Um, we're looking now at the discharge profile um, as a result um, of people staying in, in hospital and then finally at the number of beds. So that's how our bed models works. Variable um, arrivals by a day of the week and hour of the day, uh, variable lengths of stay depending on arrival times, variable discharge and um, a finite number of beds. Now the, the question that this uh, model was built to um, answer is uh, to look at the most effective improvement scenarios that would uh, relieve the congestion, that would stop some of the queues and stop patients waiting for beds on the basis that this was not a good outcome for, for, for your patients. Um, and of course if you're a busy hospital and you've got a number of potential um, outcomes that you might be able to, you've got a number of potential improvements that you might want to implement, um, you, um, you might want to select one of these. So this is what happens if GP arrive, referrals arrive earlier in the day. So you can see we've just shifted the arrivals uh, in this default position to come early in the day. Um, in scenario two, we were looking at our ambulatory care, um, care patients and what would happen if they were treated elsewhere. So our default is that 25% um, of our patients are ambulatory, but people can change this in the model. Um, and what you could say is, well, what happens if those paper, patients who really shouldn't have stayed um, for these number of nights are now not going to stay? Um, and you can select the patients that stayed, the proportions of patients by number of nights that they stay. Scenario three um, is looking at the cohort of patients who stay two midnights or less. So research suggests that 65% of patients in the best performing hospitals should be staying two night, midnights or less. So we'll say what happens if um, those patients who are 60% say of those patients who stay for three midnights, 30% who stay for four midnights, and 10% who stay by five, for five midnights now only stay two midnights or less. And let's say of those patients, 20% don't stay any midnight stay at all, 30% stay one midnight, and 50% two midnight stays. Scenario number four is what happens if we move the discharge curve forward to earlier in the day, and so patients are discharged quicker. And improvement scenario five is looking at what happens if we reduce the 14 night length of stay for over 75. So in this particular model, we've got a proportion of patients who are over 75, um, and some of them are staying 14 nights. So let's say that 50% of that group are now going to stay less time because we put in place uh, uh, some improvement. And so instead, they're going 20% of them will stay two nights, 30% will stay seven midnights, and then the 50% no change. So here are our five improvement scenarios. Um, and we're just for fun, we'll ask you which one of those do you think is going to have the most impact? And my colleague is just going to launch a poll now. So you've got these five questions um, and um, we'll ask you to vote. So I'll just pause whilst you do that. Okay, are the results in? Right, thank you very much. So I'm going to, um, we're going to show you the results now. And what we can see is that 45% of you wanted to move the discharges to earlier in the day. 27% of you wanted to uh, 
have the GP referrals come in early, earlier. 18% wanted to reduce the 14 night stays for over 75s. Um, and 9% wanted to treat ambulatory care elsewhere. So thank you very much for that. Um, and um, it's very interesting. Each time I run this, I always get completely different answers, which I think for me is one of the reasons why I think simulation is useful, because intuitively, actually everyone has got a slightly different idea about what we ought to do to relieve the pressures on beds. Um, and if we collectively don't really know, we all have different ideas, then we do need some evidence. So just to put you out of your misery, um, it's the over 75 scenario um, who um, that wins here. Obviously, all of those scenarios do create um, a benefit in terms of, of bed weights. And you can see we've got the baseline here that we've run through. Um, and then we've got the results. We've got the results for each of those scenarios. And of course, if you do all of them, then um, uh, then that's really good. So uh, well done to those 18 percent of you who got that right. Um, it's, it's always a really interesting exercise, but it's those sorts of decisions that if we want to stop patient wait, patients waiting, which means they are going to um, deteriorate and their outcomes are going to get worse, um, we really need to uh, address and we need to know what it is we've got to do to make a difference. And then um, another very interesting uh, simulation that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, a piece of work that was done by the national team um, in the NHS looking at the impact of um, uh, having seven day working. And I know uh, on both sides of the, of the pond, we've all been looking at seven day working and particularly concerned at the inpatients that are more likely to die if they're admitted to hospital at a weekend because the decision makers aren't so much um, uh, available. And um, of course, the services and case mix of patients at the weekend tends to be different to a weekday anyway. Um, and what David and his team looked at is um, a whole system model which looks at arrivals through the emergency department into the medical assessment unit, into wards and, and out again. And um, his key parameters were whether diagnostics were available and also who's making the decision, whether it was a junior doctor or um, a senior physician. Um, and the differences that you saw in terms of mortality um, as a result of that. Um, and his conclusions were with his team was that you don't just need more senior decision makers at the weekend, you also need diagnostic services because otherwise the decision makers have got no diagnostics on which to make their, their decisions if you want to reduce mortality rates. But also the, the other interesting things, and I have to say that this was, um, uh, we got the same results when we did a, a similar study looking at seven day working, is that um, one of the things that people say is, well, it's, um, it's great to see that uh, we can stop deaths, but one of the things we expect is if we bring more people in the weekend, then we'll reduce lengths of stay because we can make decisions at the weekend um, and then people can leave. And actually, that's not, I mean, that is true for the weekend. So you, when you look at the results at the bottom here, you can see the base case and then you can see what happens when you've got additional weekend resource. So you can see that length of stay does reduce um, when you have the uh, additional weekend resource at the end of the week, but at the beginning of the week, actually it increases. Um, and I think what, one of, what we found with our particular um, uh, study was that there, when we looked at the data, there is this massive Friday effect in, in a hospital. And what it's showing is that um, you've got, um, it, basically, if you come in on a Monday, you're much more likely to stay four nights. If you come in on a Tuesday, you're much more likely to stay three nights. So this is kind of push out on a Friday. Well, of course, if you've got decision makers and diagnostics available um, at the weekend, there's no pressure to do quite quite the same. So you do get that that sort of, um, you do get that slightly unintuitive kind of result. So again, very interesting, but something we really do need to crack if we're going to stop these high rates of mortality at the weekend. Um, 
So what I wanted to come on to now is simulating pathways, and I'll just start this before going on to sepsis pathway with a, a very interesting case study uh, on the adoption of the BMP blood test for heart, for heart failure. This is the serum NP testing for suspected heart failure patients. Now this was um, um, this simulation was undertaken in um, one area of the UK and then adopted by NHS Improvement um, as the way to test whether uh, adoption of this particular test was going to derive the right outcomes. And it's now part of the National Institute of Clinical Excellence uh, guidance, as, as you can see, for looking at chronic heart failure. Now, the problem was that this, this blood test had come in, it was available, uh, but in 46% uh, of payers, it was not implemented. So patients were not getting the benefit that they could possibly have got. Um, and of course, the reason that people were worried about it was they were worried about the cost of this additional test and the resource that it might use up. Would it really have those sorts of outcomes and, and what, would it, what would it mean? So they developed a simulation that, looked, that, that ran this through using the clinical evidence for benefits and actually found that you not only did you get the benefit in terms of patient outcomes, but also there was a small saving to be made for each pair. Um, and what that did was to help overcome some of the reluctance to adopt the best evidence in, in order to provide that benefit for patients. And certainly what I find is that most systems, most decision makers need to see that. It, in, in a way, you know, the clinical evidence is important, but you do need to understand what the impact is on both financially, um, from, on the base of your resources, as well as the expected outcomes for your patients at a local level in order to be able to make that decision to implement. So the case study I wanted to talk to you about in a bit more depth is um, a sepsis simulation model. So when we were um, starting to think about using simulation in patient safety, um, we wanted to develop a simulation which tackled a uh, uh, a key patient safety issue um, and one that we could really help to improve. Um, so we chose sepsis. Um, as you know, I'm sure uh, sepsis is an inflammatory response to an infection and it's progressive. So you start with the infection, you go on to sepsis, you go on to severe sepsis and septic shock. Um, and it affects in the UK 100,000 people a year um, and there's a very high mortality rate, about 35%. And it is completely preventable. So it is um, uh, that's that's an unacceptably high mortality rate, I think, and especially if you know that you could have done something about it. So what we wanted to do was to simulate this probability of infection using a disease progression model, progressing two sepsis from a hospital admission, um, test it with a hospital, and then test it with further hospitals, um, so that we could work out how you could localize this. As so we thought. If we were going to go to the effort of, of getting a correct um, disease model, which shows how sepsis develops, um, uh, then we needed to be, you know, we, we should be able to get it to a number of different people who could use that same model and just localise it with some key parameters rather than having to, to reinvent the wheel. Um, and what people would want to do is to test the impact of the improvement strategies. So here's our sepsis model. Um, and I'll just flick over to the actual model rather than the screenshot. So um, we're, um, we haven't put a, a very pretty front end on it as yet, but we will be doing that. Um, but what you can see is we've got this disease regression model, um, which powers a discrete simulation model. So <coughs> what's that, what that means is um, whilst you're in a particular stage, then you are likely to receive a particular uh, set of services, have a particular uh, length of stay. So these services on the right-hand side, the, the length of stay in the bed, are dictated by the state that you're in. And the state that you're in is dictated by your likelihood of moving from state to state if there's no intervention. So I'm just going to run this through so you can see on the screen what's happening is people are coming into those states. We've got all admissions coming in. A number of those are discharged. There's a, a small proportion that are likely to have an infection and then another proportion likely to have sepsis and of course you can 
move from state to state. Um, the sepsis patients um, have a probability of dying or moving on to severe, severe sepsis or getting better and just going back to being a normal admission and, and so on until everybody's uh, discharged. Um, and at the bottom you can see the numbers uh, developing here. So what we were uh, wanting to do was to test this with the data that we had and make sure, I've just done run, one run here, that the results we were getting were as expected against the data. So the simulation was replicating uh, a reasonable replication of the number of infections from the total number of admissions and how they progress through uh, to sepsis deaths. So I hope, I hope that makes sense as the sort of overview of the model. Um, and of course we know that the, the improvement interventions are that the more frequent and effective um, observations you do um, the, and the earlier intervention you're able to put in place then uh, the better chance um, of, of cure. And of course there's an impact on patient outcomes and their length of stay. So um, we used a number of different assumptions. We used healthcare activity, but we also used assumptions from death research. Uh, from death research. Um, and you can see um, the progression rates in some of our sources here. So um, we know from admissions data that 2.5% of our patients are likely to be infected. And then you can see how they progress through those different states there. And also then the likelihood of mortality once you're in each of those states. And the important thing for the model is that the patient will progress through each of those states in sequence. Um, and then as you transition from admission to infection, there's that 2.5%, but that 2.5% is, is consistent for every day that a patient stays in hospital. So we're using that formula. So what we're doing is recording the number of days that a patient has spent in each state and then each day the patient spends increases the progression the, the, the patients the patients is in the hospital you read that data off the spreadsheet so um, we're essentially putting all of those assumptions in a, in a spreadsheet which is um, accessed by the model so each patient is assigned a length of stay based on an average distribution so if you're in an infection state, then your likely length of stay is 3.7 days to septic shock, which is around 20 days. And you can see that we've drawn on different uh, research evidence because not every hospital has this kind of data. Um, but of course, you, you could look for it. But this was a, a fairly straightforward way for us to look at um, what the likely length of stay would be. And, and this can be changed in the model. Um, and the patient recovers once they've spent the uh, requisite amount of time in that particular state. So every day you have that risk of uh, progression. So from sepsis to severe sepsis, severe sepsis to septic shock, and again that risk of mortality each day that the patient is in one of those states. And so this is the kind of data that we need to create um, a baseline for any hospital. So the scenarios we tested were what happens if we increase the number of patients who receive treatment, what happens if we increase the number of patients <coughs> who treated with one hour, within one hour and also within three hours. We looked at septic shock and severe sepsis independently and together, um, and we looked at the impact on mortality. So again, using research um, assumptions, you can see um, that well, we, we knew from the assumptions of this particularly useful study that 30% of patients are unlikely to receive uh, effective treatment. So we created a, a probability distribution based on that research, um, which, which shows that kind of um, survival um, and the likelihood of people, um, the, the onset of sepsis from, from that. And here's our results. So if you increase the number of patients who are receiving uh, treatment, so 30 percent, so we'll be looking at 30 percent who are not effectively treated, um, who have set shock over 36 hours. Um, the graph is showing you that you can move from that 
35% mortality base to around 33%. Um, and if you bring that forward to three hours, so treating those patients within three hours, uh, you can bring that mortality rate down to 29.65%, um, so you're reducing by 5%, and again by 6% if you treat within one hour. Um, and so we looked at further results where what happens if you treat 50% of people with septic shock um, and severe sepsis either progressively or at the last minute um, and what happens if you treat 100% with septic, severe sepsis and septic shocks progressively um, at the last minute and what happens if you treat everyone uh, with both those conditions within an hour. And again, we have these results here. So you can start to see the impact of your um, interventions on mortality um, depending on how many people you're able to treat and how quickly. So you could bring that down really quite significantly as a result. So our future development in this model, the, so we, we, we're happy that the disease model is, is, is measuring the disease as it progresses and then the impact of change. But the, the next part of that uh, work is to measure our, the bed days that people are, are using. So we've also got some results um, around that. Also look at other factors um, and develop our user um, in, interface. And we're interested in talking to anybody who'd like to collaborate on this with us. We've um, already presented it to um, some key patient safety groups. Uh, it's been very well received. Um, we want to test it with other groups to see whether this resonates with them as well, because we obviously being able to make an impact on sepsis is, is really key. And if we can help to do that with, with simulation, we'd be absolutely delighted. So that's really where I want to end. I hope that's been um, a helpful insight um, or ideas if you haven't um, been thinking about this, about using simulation in patient safety. Um, and we believe that um, we can help improve patient safety just by testing those intervention and impacts before you implement them, looking, providing a better evidence base for change which might help um, expedite better decision making and sharing those best practice messages um, and helping stakeholders to understand them, to understand what the impact of change might be and engaging them in that process. So before um, I sign off, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions um, that have occurred to you over the, the webinar. Um, and I've had a couple where people have typed them in whilst, whilst we've been um, speaking. So I'll just read those out and um, think of the, the answers. So um, one question we've had is, um, other than sepsis, what other areas would you like to see simulated around patient safety? That's a really interesting question. I mean, if I think about that sepsis model, um, the, the way that it's built, the way that it's conceived, which is um, you're in a particular state and you're deteriorating unless an intervention um, is implemented, um, fits with a number of other conditions. So I'm thinking of pressure ulcers, for example, um, behaves in, in a similar kind of way, perhaps pain management. Um, so any sort of deterioration where an intervention might stop that deterioration would be a, a suitable kind of question to use that sort of sepsis models model, but you may well have other ideas and please do um, post those up using LinkedIn, perhaps later if you don't want to now. Um, right, another question is, um, the sepsis model had research data in it, um, would it be possible to use my data in this and how easy would that be? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we built it really with that purpose in, in mind and we use research data really to try and get as correct a model as we possibly could, knowing that probably progression rates for sepsis are not something that most hospitals would collect. So we thought if we got the underlying logic of the model right, 
then it should be reasonably easy to put local data in. So um, if I go back to, um, if I had a slide up about the sort of data that you need, there we go. So you, for this, as a, as a, as a sort of baseline for that model, you'd need um, to know your number of patients that are admitted, um, number of patients with sepsis and different forms of sepsis if you've got it, and certainly the number um, of patients who died. And, and with that, you could start to get some useful results, which you'd then probably refine. And, oh, yeah, another question. How long does it take to build the model? So we had quite, obviously, we had to do quite a lot of research um, to start with. As, so the model actually didn't take that long to build. So um, probably in the last time, it was about a week. Um, but we we kept going back to it and refining it because more data would become available or um, with our, our research we'd find out something new and then we'd test it. So um, as a project it's probably taken us um, uh, two or three months and we think that you know if we go out to a hospital with it tomorrow somebody would give us some more insights that would mean that you'd probably build something else in. But to get that to this, the level that it currently is um, and also with a, a lot of interaction with uh, some of the stakeholders we've been working with. Um, probably a build five months, but, um, but of the project and the toing and froing, um, sorry, five, five days, um, building a, a, a couple of months. But then obviously with a simulation, that's part of the benefit of it. If you're, um, you build the simulation, then what you want to do is to develop your understanding as a result of seeing what the simulation is telling you, and that's a benefit in itself. People are learning from that, so I don't. That's not sort of time elapsed before you get any value from it. Value was being derived from this model, um, I think, all along. Any other questions that people might want to ask? No. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining the webinar. Again, I hope it was useful. Uh, we'll be posting up uh, some of these questions, and if you want to ask um, subsequent questions, please post them through, and we'll um, answer them, and we'll post some of them up on our LinkedIn site, Simulating Health, and we'll be sending you through details of that in, in case you're not already uh, joined up to it. Um, and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion. If you're interested in any of these models, if you're particularly interested in the sepsis model, do please um, give us a call and talk to us um, if you're interested in testing it out or you've got ideas for how we might improve it. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, our next webinar will be in November, um, so we do these monthly, um, and we are going to be at the Healthcare Design Conference in November where we've got a very exciting product that we're launching um, specifically for healthcare design. So we will be, our webinar next time will be focusing on the spatial environment and using simulation for design. So very different question but still highly relevant and hope that some of you will be able to join us then. Thank you very much. <laughs>